We continue with our study this afternoon of spiritual things. I hope we are, if it was needed to be done, dispelling some of the ideas that are erroneous concerning what it is to be a spiritual person, how one is a spiritual person. I hope that it's becoming clear that to be spiritual, one is an obedient child of God, a faithful child of God. One is doing things as the Word of God says we ought to do them. And one is simply in submission to the will of the living God. It's no mystical thing. It's no better felt than told type thing. It's simply understanding from the heart the will of heaven and discharging our obligations to God, which is again being faithful. This afternoon, I'd like to study with you some errors concerning spirituality. A few of those I mentioned by way of introduction to the lesson this afternoon just now. As you look round about you in the religious world claiming Christ as Savior, you'll see that some people will say, well, to be spiritual is to have enjoyed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That just simply comes from the wrong understanding of the Bible regarding why there was such a thing as the baptism of the Holy Spirit and who it was that experienced it and the purpose that they experienced it. If you look at Holy Spirit baptism, you'll see that it's a promise that Christ made to the apostles. Now, it ought to be understood that you don't obey a promise. Christ simply selected the apostles. Apostle meaning one sent out to do a specific thing. So the apostles of Christ are those chosen by the Lord to accomplish a certain thing. And we've spent a lot of time here Sunday morning in recent weeks emphasizing that they are the ambassadors of Christ. They are the witnesses of Christ. That therefore this promise of the Holy Spirit to them, the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit, was to nobody else but the apostles. In Acts 1 and verse 5, we can see this particular point made. You will see as you go on down through the chapter in verse 8 that this was the power that was to come to them. From a close study of the uh, John, the uh, 14th, 15th, 16th chapters, You'll find the Lord's personal private discussion with the apostles concerning his leaving this world and how they were to be able to do what he had chosen them to do. And he makes it clear that the Holy Spirit would take up residence with them and he would be to them what Christ had been to them in the flesh. You'll remember that we talked about in our brief study of the Holy Spirit a few weeks before the lectureship of the parakletos relationship the Holy Spirit had with the apostles. That it was more than just a comforter as the Lord said as it's rendered in the King James Version would be to the apostles. He was a comforter to them. But it was far more than that. I always emphasize that if you want to understand the relationship invisibly of the Holy Spirit with the apostles then think of what Christ was to the apostles. Think of all the things that he did with them. And so it is, you'll understand, he has been put to death. He's been raised from the dead. And he's ascended back to heaven. And thus the apostles are chosen witnesses. And they would need to have infallible power beyond human power to be able to write down all, the, well even to remember it, all that Christ had taught and other things that he had not taught that now comprise the perfect law of liberty of the New Testament. And it would be the Holy Spirit who would enable them so to do. But he would be in a relationship with the apostles what the Lord was in the flesh with them. So they received power after that the Holy Ghost had come upon them. It was then that they would be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. 
best way I think I can tell anybody to see the relationship of the Holy Spirit with the apostles is to remember the work the Lord had with them, as I've said, and then look and see through the book of Acts the work of the Holy Spirit with them. And we understand then that in order to get the truth into the world, to get the church here in view of the great antagonism of the devil toward Christ and toward the church, that it would take supernatural things to get it going. That's not unusual because the world started by a miracle and then it settled into the natural laws. And so it is that the church, the spiritual kingdom of Christ, started by a miracle. And yet you have then the regular preaching of the word, the seed of the kingdom, or the spiritual procreative act, even as there was the natural procreative act as to how things got into this world and then all of the rules of, of physics and so forth that God set up and by the word of his power, the rod of Hebrews tells us, still upholds all the workings that are in the natural world. Well, you had the miracle, if you please, Acts 2, Day of Pentecost, establishing the Lord's church. But then you find once the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, has been fully revealed, then all of that passes away. And now how do you become a Christian? Well, you, out of an honest, good heart, learn the truth of the gospel. And finding those things in that truth that obligates you to be obedient to God from the heart, you obey the gospel. And you're added to the church by the Lord. And so you live by the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God or the seed of the kingdom. And thus Paul said, preach the word. So when you look at this, you see that baptism in the Holy Spirit wasn't for everybody. It was for the apostles to enable them to do what God said they needed to do. You'll remember that Paul said in defending his apostleship in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, that he said the signs of an apostle, the signs of an apostle had been wrought among the Corinthians. Well, remember, um, a sign then goes along with the office in this case. A sign, not a sign of itself, but a sign points to something else. And so you could tell who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. The churches would have no problem doing that if they themselves were informed enough to have the wherewithal to know who was a genuine, true apostles of Christ. We find reading the letter of the Ephesians, the book of Revelation, that some claimed to be apostles, and the Lord commended the church there because you've tried them and found them that they're liars and they're not apostles of Christ. Well, I know one reason they could do it. And that is, a fellow said, well, I'm an apostle of Christ, like Peter or Paul, all right? Then you'll have the credentials of your office. You'll have the signs that God has given you that you are. What are they? Well, you can work miracles. You could do any particular miracle that the Holy Spirit enabled them to do. And as I said this morning, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll find nine of them listed there, plus one, the ability to lay hands on folks in the church and confer upon them a certain miraculous gift. The apostles had that. Paul didn't mind saying, you know, I'm an apostle because I bore the signs of an apostle. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the household of Cornelius, it was like it was on the day of Pentecost, Acts 10, 44 and 48. But it did not do for the household of Cornelius what it did for the apostles. And for the household of Cornelius, it was heaven directly, not through human agents, but directly telling those Jews and uncircumcised Gentiles have a right to the gospel just like you do. And they recognized that to be the case. So again, you see that these things were not commands. You must be baptized with the Holy Spirit to be spiritual. No, no, not at all. It was just simply the way that the truth of the New Testament got on this earth and was proven to be the Word of God and not the Word of men. So it was, a, it was that which was temporary and provisionary. Now keep that in mind. It's important in ascertaining the authority of the Lord to understand there's some things in the New Testament that are temporary and provisionary. Now while they were there, that is while the miraculous gifts were in the churches, then there were rules that govern the use of them. And you've got that in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Now it's interesting how we get them because we get them, as Paul writes a letter to the church at Corinth, to correct them on many things. And we find then that as he corrects them on their abuse and misuse of the miraculous gifts, 
we learn about the way they were to be used because he has to tell them this because they're in violation of it. So we learn that all of that was special. It was temporary as the miracles were and that when they had accomplished all God intended them to accomplish, then they ceased. And that's the burden of 1 Corinthians 13, last few verses, as well as Ephesians chapter 4. So a lot of people think that spirituality means you can work miracles or you're receiving direct guidance from God like the apostles did. But that just comes from a lack of understanding of this temporary period in history of the church from the time that it was established for some like 40 years thereafter that uh, these miracles were in the church until the whole New Testament could be revealed and written down. As old brother Wallace used to say, he said, now if you want a miracle nowadays, I'll read you one. And that's exactly right. I can read you all the miracles that people claim to work today and can't do it and more beyond that. I can read them. I never have seen some of these folks that talk about modern name miracles workers, miracles being done or worked like the apostles who would want to work the miracles that Peter did, but then not Sapphira. <laughs> never have seen that. Well, you know, if you have the working of the Holy Spirit today through the apostles as he did then, then you would expect to see that maybe somewhere. I've never seen any of them do what Paul did to, Sir, uh, to uh, um, Elymas, Bar Jesus, Cyprus, before uh, Sergius Paulus when he struck him blind. Well, it all goes in ter the same territory. And somebody said you can't have the tongues without the snakes. It all goes along the same way. So if you're going to have the Holy Spirit doing today what he did then and that spirituality, you're going to have every one of these miracles work today. In fact, you don't have miracles without apostles. And yet a lot of these Pentecostal groups will have what they claim to be miracles, but they don't have apostles. The Mormon church is more consistent with that line because they claim apostles too. Not that they have the signs of an apostle. And then the Roman Catholic Church does better along that line when they claim that the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church are simply right where the apostles were. That's the reason we pressed them on the point, if you remember, uh, that if they were in those offices, they had the credentials of that office. And I don't see any of them with the credentials of that office. So they don't have the office, no matter what they claim. Well, to be spiritual is, again, let me say, nothing more than humbly keeping the commandments of God and living like he said live. You can't get more spiritual than that. Well, the spiritual gifts fall into all of that, too. Some people confuse being spiritual with uh, gifts. And so you've got tongue speaking and the other miraculous gifts. It's always interesting to me that even today when there are no miraculous gifts, you've got the same problem in the mind of men that you had when they were. Because you'll remember at Corinth, they exalted those that could speak in tongues above all the rest of the gifts. Well, today, when they don't even have them, it shows you the attitude of man hadn't changed because they still exalt the speaking in tongues above the other miracles. Somebody said one time, well, speaking in tongues, how does it work? And I heard Brother Gus Nichols say this. He said, well, he said they, they just start trying to speak, and it just gradually comes out. Brother Nichols said, that's the way my own babies learn to speak. They start trying to speak. <laughs> gradually it just comes out. But the idea of tongues is nothing more than languages, and that's all it was in that far-off distant time when the church started, so that the truth could be gotten out to as many people as possible as quickly as possible. In their own tongues, they heard the word preached, and it was done miraculously. So that speaking in tongues or having the miraculous gifts was not at all being spiritual, as the common spirituality that faithfulness uh, has to do with in being a Christian. Now we've got a big deal that goes on nowadays and has for years and years of personal religious experience. Personal religious experience. And many times people refer to this as the Christian witness. The Christian witness. Well, you not find anything like that in the New Testament. The idea is, is let me tell you what God's done for me. It goes back to the point of let me relate to you my salvation experience. Now, where does that come from? The old Calvinistic doctrine that said God before the world was foreordained and predestined certain ones 
to be saved and the same concerning those lost. And nobody knew who they were. All have inherited Adam's original sin according to this false doctrine. So how do you find out? Well, the Holy Spirit's got to directly move upon you because you can't attend to the Word of God. It's a good thing. And a person having Adam's original sin is in kind of no good thing at all. So the Word of God can't do you any good. So the Holy Spirit's got to work directly upon you, separate and apart from any medium. So people would long to be saved. They don't know whether they're one of the elect. It's only the elect. Christ shed his blood for it. He shed his blood for everybody. And they don't know whether they're predestined to be uh, lost or be saved. So they pray and they moan and they carry on. And everybody exhorts them and all this kind of stuff until they get some sort of signal from God that they are saved. Well, they had to say that to the church in those days. And in the Baptist church, basically in those days, they would give their testimony, their salvation experience, and then according to Baptist doctrine, they'd vote on them to see whether they accepted them or not. And if they accepted them, then they considered them saved, and they were baptized in the Baptist church. That was the process. Nowadays, the fundamental teachings of each doctrine, of each denomination, has been pretty much blurred over. And nowadays, it's just a matter of saying, in my mind, I know I'm a sinner, and I can't save myself, and God loves me, God gave Christ, and I accept Christ, my personal Savior. And pretty much anything else is all uh, whatever you want it to be. But you can't find anything like that in your New Testament. That's the thing we keep saying to folks. How do you know anything about Christianity without the very infallible primary source of Christianity? And that's the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular. Now, if I can't find in the Holy Spirit's own word, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, if I can't find what to do to be saved from that, where do I go to find what to do to be saved? And so we look at uh, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, his last will and testament, to know his will. And we learn then that to be a spiritual person, to be saved spiritually, then one must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of his or her sin, confess his faith in Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Having done that, the Lord adds you to the church, in fact, in the very process of it. And there you live as the perfect law of liberty teaches you to live in worship, in the organization of the church, and so on. And that's as spiritual as you can get. You cannot get any more spiritual than rendering obedience to what God said. Now you say, but I can, or if you can, tell me how. How can you have a closer walk with God than knowing His will and submitting to it wherein He has told you there are certain things you must do, certain ways to do it, and for certain reasons? You can't do it. It's an impossibility. So the way that's right and cannot be wrong is to study and rightly divide the word of truth and learn the will of heaven and learn the obligations God in that will has placed on you and then submit to them. That's what we do. We're taught to examine ourselves, whether we are in the faith. We're taught to prove our own selves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. You know, if we would prove our own selves, we wouldn't have to be that concerned. In fact, we wouldn't have to be concerned at all about the day we stand before that same divine document, the New Testament, and we're ju judged on the basis of that standard. When you read 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, it says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And here we just read in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Prove your own selves. Well, if I were to ask you today, are you a Christian like you read of in your New Testament? How would you prove to me you're a Christian? <coughs> well, you would simply show me from the will of Jesus Christ, your Savior, that which He required of you to become a Christian. And you know what you would do if I wasn't a Christian? After you had shown me that you from the heart had complied with every step in God's great plan of salvation, you would say, and you can become one too if you'll do the same thing with the same attitude toward God, yourself, and His Word that all people had as you read of it in your own New Testament. Now, if you can't become a Christian that way, tell me how you're ever going to become a Christian. And if that's not being spiritual, as the New Testament defines spiritual, then tell me what it is. In fact, notice this. 
It's interesting to note that doctrine is also referred to as spirit as well as false doctrine, as false spirits. Listen to this where John writes to Christians in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Now think about that for a minute. Is he talking about Casper the friendly ghost coming up and whispering in your ear and you better not listen to him? No. The idea is the spirit or the spirits, and I'm speaking of not the Holy Spirit here, that, that he reaches, that is whatever the false doctrine is, he's pictured as a spirit. Well, who is the father of lies? Well, it's the devil. So when you see that doctrine equates with spirit, then to teach a false doctrine, well, that's considered to be a false spirit. So believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Now, he can't be talking about a person who is a spirit. How would you try spirit? But you can compare and contrast what you've been taught with God's word. And that's what John is saying. Somebody comes to you and tells you a certain thing. Well, then don't you know your Bible? Can't you say that's not in the Bible? That's not what the Lord taught? Can we know what the Lord taught? Can we know what His last will and testament says? The Bible over and over again says you can. That's what it's here for. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. James 1, 25. But He says here that we're to do this because many false prophets are going out into the world. He equates uh, spirits with the prophets. The idea that a spirit has a bearing on you through the doctrine taught. Now how do I become a child of the devil? Just believe a lie and obey it. Because the devil's the father of lies. Remember, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, speaking of Pharisees and chief priests and those. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Well, what does that say about people teaching contrary to the truth of the New Testament today? They'd be the same thing, wouldn't they? If you live contrary to the New Testament of Jesus Christ, who's your father? Who's leading, guiding, and directing you? Well, the truth comes from Jesus Christ. So if you're going contrary to the truth of Jesus Christ, who's left out there to guide you? There's only two sources. There's only two sources of doctrine. And that's God. Or the devil. Now where do you find God's doctrine? In the Bible. Specifically concerning Christianity, the New Testament. Now if somebody says, all right, look, the church doesn't make a bit of difference to your salvation. But can I read the New Testament of Christ? Can I understand that those who were baptized for the remission of sins on the day the church started were by the Lord Himself added to the church? Do we have a lot of material telling us how the church worships? Do we have something that says all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus? Ephesians 1, 3. Do we have something that says to the Galatians that you were baptized into Christ? Galatians 3, 27. Well, I don't know any other way to get into Christ where God's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places other than to be baptized into Christ. I don't know of a soul who's ready to be baptized into Christ who has not confess their faith in Christ. I don't know of a soul who has been baptized and who has confessed his faith in Christ that did not first repent of their sins. And prior to that, have faith by accepting the word of God in Christ's form. Now, if somebody tells you that you don't have to do all of that and you can't find what they're telling you in the New Testament or it sets aside what you already know the Bible says, uh, who's the father of that? Well, it, only, it has to be either God or the devil. Now, God's Word's in the Bible. Well, what you're hearing is contrary to God's Word. Reckon where it comes from. You know, we just don't think on those terms, but we ought to. The standard then for testing or proving any doctrine is the inspired Word of God. Search the Scriptures, Acts 17, 11. Now, notice, if any man thinketh himself to be a prophet... Or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. What is Paul saying? I'm an inspired apostle. I have the signs of an apostle, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. And what I say to you is the will of heaven. 
And you've got to do it to be saved. Did the church believe that? They sure did. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. Why did they do it? Because they knew that Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was giving His will to mankind through the apostles and prophets. Now, there's only two sources, I say again. Only two sources of truth. God is the source for truth. Well, if somebody comes teaching you then that this is the truth, but it's contrary to what God's revealed, then you know now it's not a source of truth, but it's a source of error. Now, if you say, but I think there's other places error can come from. Where is it going to come from except from Satan? When a person teaches a false doctrine, he's teaching the will of Satan. A false doctrine is contrary to the truth. It's a lie. That's the only thing that can deceive you. Go back to the very beginning. You see it ever so clear. God gave his directions as to how Abel and Cain were to worship. God had respect to Abel's offering. Why? Because Abel did what God told him to in the way God told him to do it for the reason. But he didn't, Cain. Why? Because it wasn't by faith. Why wasn't it by faith? Because it wasn't by the word of God. What difference does that make? Faith can be hearing the Word of God. Abel's wasn't by faith. Couldn't be by the Word of God. If it had been by the Word of God, it would have been by faith. But it wasn't by faith. Yet Hebrews 11, 4 says that Abel's was by faith. Abel offered unto God. It was by faith that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He being dead, yet speaketh. Well, what does he say to us? You've got to operate by faith. But faith comes by what? The Word of God. Not the word of the devil. Because when Cain did not do what God told him to, as Abel did, then he followed a false doctrine. He believed a lie and obeyed a lie, was deceived thereby, and was not acceptable to God. It has not changed, beloved brethren. Though the law of patriarchy changed, it changed for the Jews to the law of Moses. Both of them's gone now, and all men approach God in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Our Lord has all authority in heaven and on earth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, how can I come to the Father by Christ? And he's the only way to do it. Well, without a teaching for me to believe and obey, I can't. Well, I'm going to come to the Father by Christ. How? Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be down. So if you want to be lost, just don't believe. But if you want to be saved, believe and be baptized and you will be saved. That's not false doctrine. That's the truth. And you can't get any more spiritual than that. Then there are those who teach once saved, always saved. Or once you're saved by Christ, you can't do anything in order to be lost eternally. But spirituality doesn't mean once saved, always saved. I learned from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, that a Christian can become carnal and it's condemned. Well, are you saying the carnal Christian can go to heaven? A person falls away from the faith, from the system that is the New Testament system. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Well, you're going to lose your spirituality and do it. If you want to cease to be spiritual, just know the will of God and don't do it. And you're not spiritual. Or know the will of God and change it. Paul got a little upset since the Holy Spirit was guiding him. God did too. In Galatians 1, when he said, Though we are an angel from heaven, preaching the other gospel unto you, then that which you have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. The Greek means anathema, which means the false teacher should be cut off. It's a play on words because the Judaizing teachers are saying you Gentiles must be circumcised and keep the law. Paul says, uh, let them be cut off. If anybody's going to cut anything, let them be cut off. That's how vivid that is in the Greek. Just how vivid it is. And we need to understand then how God feels about a fellow that comes along teaching something contrary to the Word of God. Let him be cut off. Let him be anathema. Let him be a castaway. That's the reason I do not want to be found teaching false doctrine. Because I know what's going to happen to me. I'll be a child of the devil, first of all. 
And I'll be communicating to you that which is not the Lord's will. And you can't be spiritual if you believe it. You can't be saved if you believe it. Well, so much for all of that. There's so many things that, how do you say it, can lead one away. But when they're all reduced down to the very minimum, it just simply comes down to whatever is contrary to the authority of Jesus Christ is not spiritual because it's not of Christ. Worldly pleasure, emotionalism, even prosperity in this world, or innovations, worshiping the way we want to, we'll worship. All those things are not of the Father, but they're of the devil. And they're not spiritual. That is spiritual, that is acceptable to God. If you want to not be spiritual, just simply don't pay attention to the Bible. And don't do what he said do. And you've accomplished it. That's all there is to it. It's very easy not to be spiritual. But if you will be spiritual, what the New Testament defines spirituality. It'll be the attitude of speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command and I will obey. No person is spiritual who does not obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. Whosoever groweth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, you don't let him in your house, you don't bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deed. And folks, I'm telling you, that's not spiritual. That's contrary to the will of heaven. That's how you become lost. That's how you become a child of the devil. That's how you get caught up in sin. So the disposition of every person who would go to heaven is to speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command that I will obey. I don't know what he will command me to do. I don't know what is entailed with my keeping those commandments throughout life. I don't know where to lead me. But I know he's in control and nothing will ever come upon me that is to my hurt, ultimately and finally, and spiritually. So the attitude is complete faith in God, taking God at his word with a living and active faith that will cause us to obey him every time. Not my will, but thine be done. Now that's a spiritual attitude. And it will keep you in harmony with God by obedience to his will in all things. So no wonder Paul says, but God be thanked, that you were the service of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. That's spirituality. Above that, you can't get any more spiritual than that. So if you're subject to the invitation of Christ this evening, are you abiding in the doctrine of Christ? Or are you listening to a message that will deceive, that's contrary to God? Now, if it's contrary to God, you're listening to Satan's message. You're listening to the voice of Satan. That's all there is to it. But if it's harmony with the teaching of the New Testament, that's the right spiritual message. That's the truth. John 8, 31 and 32. John 17, 17. And that's the thing you need to believe and from the heart obey. You need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be baptized for the remission of your sin. And as a child of God who remains spiritual in His church, you live like the New Testament says Christians are to live. You worship like the New Testament says Christians are to worship. You deal with one another like the New Testament says you're to deal with one another. And so on until Christ calls you home. If you sinned in that manner and you need to repent, then we hope you'll humble yourself and do so and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Do so now while we stand and while we sing.